time to go? Yeah, yeah, I'm all good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, good evening or good morning and everything in between <laughs> uh, from wherever you're connected. Uh, today we are um, uh, continuing our lecture series with our second uh, in the row lecture, this time from uh, Artur uh, Mamoumani. So um, Artur is many things and I will say it with you in a while, but um, uh, more importantly for us, he's um, uh, a faculty in the Master in Advanced Computation for Architecture and Design, our online master's that uh, launched its first edition this October. So we're really happy to have you here, Artur, not only because of your professional um, and architectural, uh, let's say, um, uh, career, but also because of your connection with us now. <laughs> and uh, a huge uh, welcome also to all the MA CAD uh, students that they are all here connected and proud to see their faculty. So a um, few words about um, Artur. Um, Artur Mamani is a French architect. Uh, he is the director of the award-winning uh, practice of uh, Mamumani Architects. Uh, based in London and uh, specialized in new kind of uh, digital design and fabricated architecture. Uh, Artur with his work has won uh, different um, uh, prizes, but um, what is more important is that uh, what I was saying a bit with him before is that his work is trying to raise awareness for a series of very critical things uh, about architecture and the built environment today. And of course, um, with his practice, he's uh, also introducing alternative models into that. Um, his work is encompassing not only issues of um, natural uh, and local materials, he will be speaking about this today, but more than anything, he's actually uh, pushing uh, and promoting the great potential for innovation when um, you couple sustainable thinking uh, with the computational design and the digital manufacturing uh, possibilities. So Arthur's War is conscient um, that our buildings in cities are responsible of almost 40% of CO2 emissions in the world, almost 40% of all the energy that we are consuming as well. And uh, of course, uh, the fact that the construction industry is the world's largest waste generator. No, so we need to radically rethink the way that we are uh, designing and constructing. Um, but also, you know, like we need to radically think what happens after the end uh, of the life of our buildings. And I think that some of the projects of our tour today will be dealing with that as well. Um, leave no trace. Uh, Leave No Trace is the title of his lecture. He is going to discuss about um, circular architecture. He's going to highlight the collective uh, responsibility that um, engineers, architects, designers, decision makers, contractors have in relation to reducing carbon impact into the built environment. And um, in Artur's uh, words, the environmental cost has to take priority over financial values. Um, and this means that our materials and design technologies need to serve a higher purpose than the one that we used to do until now. So um, Artur um, is um, an architect specialized in, in eco-parametricism. I, I kind of really like this term that he's using, uh, but he's also looking at uh, coupling uh, a cradle to cradle approach um, to design with uh, digital manufacturing and also with do-it-yourself manufacturing and more like makers uh, movement. Through several of his uh, projects, uh, Arthur today will show us how we should leave no trace, uh, but also how parametric design can bring us uh, closer to the natural world. So Arthur, thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you for joining our faculty team at IAC. We're very proud and happy to have you, but we're also very much looking forward to your talk today. So uh, Digital Club for Artur uh, and thank me and, and help me welcome him. Cheers. Thank, thank you so much. Yay, <laughs> Digital Club. <laughs> thank you, RIT. Um, I, you know, we were talking before this, but it's such a, an honor to speak to all of you. The, 
just before the COVID crisis around like February, I, I came for a crit. This was the last trip I did before actually catching it myself. Um, and I remember the enthusiasm when I was there because I didn't think there were many schools that tackled parametric design and digital fabrication in relation to the environment. And so I thought this was really something new, something that requires us all of us to think about. And so I, I was so happy. I don't, I guess it's sometimes there is destiny that you guys asked me to teach the MACAD program because it just felt right. So I was so happy to say yes to, to doing that. And it started already. So I see a few of the students from the MACAD in the audience. And so I'm really happy. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen and I know I've got 45 minutes. So I'll do my best to, uh, to make sure this is respected up. Here we go. So I guess I'll just get going. I can see some of your faces, uh, so I can see some kind of reactions. I hope you can still see my face. Maybe I'll show a few things. Um, but I just, um, I'll just get started and say that uh, indeed our um, uh, our profession is responsible for about uh, not us just architects. When I say our profession, the build environment is responsible for about forty percent of all carbon emissions. That's almost half. So our responsibility is obvious and our um, understanding of what we can do is crucial and science is here to help us and we have amazing tools and this talk is going to be about my mistakes and my journey because I'm just like you I'm trying to figure it out it's a very complex science. And, and so there's going to be things that respect that things that don't respect that, but I just hope you'll um, you'll embark on the journey with me. All right, you can all see my screen, right? Oh, fantastico. Okay, well, that's my office. That's where I'm actually uh, giving this talk at the moment. I'm literally sitting in the corner there. Um, our office is a little bit special. I was always told that what we do is not architecture, but I think we do. Uh, basically, what we try to do is to have a, an architecture studio um, in, the, in the kind of upper floor. And then downstairs, we have a fabrication space that is open to the public. So really, the first thing you see when you come to our studio is not like rows of computers, but lots of prototypes. And that's really important for me because I feel like there has been a disconnection between designers or the understanding of design as a sort of conceptual thing that happens separately from the act of building or making. And so we're trying to reconcile that. And uh, so therefore, it was very important to have uh, the possibility to show not just scripts or parametric things or renders or even VR, but to actually have the thing and going to the clients with the thing. Um, and so that is a kind of an essence aspect of our ecosystem. So I think gone are the days where you have like, you know, a, a sort of architects on his own that, you know, is part of some kind of, uh, you know, he receives ideas from the sky. I, you know, I've been teaching and I feel like I've been learning as well. So, you know, we, I, I'm still teaching at the University of Westminster and we called our blog, We Want to Learn. And you'll see that there's a lot of, uh, of, of knowledge that is being shared. And if you're part of the MACAD, you're probably realizing that really, I'm not really after ideas. I'm after how do we develop processes and how do we inform the processes of each other? And that's why we did Silkworm, the open source plugin for 3D printing with uh, Adam Holloway. That's why I teach all the time. I love teaching, I love learning. Um, and, and that's why I'm doing it really. But Mao Many is our architecture studio. Papab is our, is our fabrication space. This is downstairs. We have, uh, you probably are familiar with WASP, the world's advanced saving project, uh, which is a wonderful company um, that actually lend, gave us a printer. Uh, so we did Silkworm and then they just kind of gave us one because they were using the, the open source plugin. So when I say going beyond the financial values of stuff, I'll talk about leave no trace, but I also talk about the gift economy and the idea that sometimes values should be understood in the deep meaning of what values mean. So we work with machine, we try and understand them. We even try to speculate as to how machines will be in the future. Now, you know, I, I, first thing I did when setting up the company is assemble a RepRap printer, RepRap Pro at the time, it was like an open source uh, 3D printer. And, uh, you know, of course, like it wasn't the final thing. Everyone sees it as, well, that's just doing tiny projects, right? Robotics is really very similar 
no matter what the scale, the codes that you send, the G codes that you send, the general codes are all similar, whether you're in a gigantic, uh, um, uh, you know, tower crane of some sort or a tiny little 3D printer. And in this case, we got a grant from Arup. We got about 30,000 pounds to develop a new kind of robot, uh, a cable robot, which I thought was a new kind, but it's not really a new kind, in order to assemble and disassemble towers. Now that notion of disassembling a tower is something that I find very important because we are used to building permanent things. We want it to be permanent. We were raised with, you know, the, the Parthenon or things like uh, permanent ruins, beautiful ruins. Uh, John Stone, who said, I, I want to design for beautiful ruins. N no, like, I think it's very important we understand that nature disappears when it doesn't have enough water. Our buildings should disappear if the economy is going bad um, and they should move to where the economy is going well. We are, our studio is inside a container, uh, some of it, and we increase our studio space when we need to, we decrease our studio space when we need to. The idea that really it's only growth that is healthy, well, you know, it's not, because then you end up with empty buildings, you end up with things that are, so we put this in uh, Dubai as a sort of symbol, but uh, this is really important for us. Now, of course, when you come up with these ideas, uh, you're like, okay, we, we won the grant based on the idea, but <laughs> we had to build it. Um, so we started, you know, all these plugins, you guys are learning, you know, Firefly and all these beautiful open source free plugins that you have access to is amazing because it allows you to not only work on the thing itself, but also the machines that make the thing. So you don't, you're not reliant on buying really expensive machines. Like we did this in our, in our lab next door, just laser cutter, 3D printers, 3D printing winches, and so on and so forth. We had partners. So we, we came across these guys, Technalia. I'm sure you guys are working with them. I think I heard you're working with them. Uh, but then they decided to collaborate with us. They saw that uh, what we were producing was of interest for them. Because remember, all the big industrial uh, research centers, they're looking for your ideas. They're looking to collaborate. In that spirit, something that sort of fell on me because I didn't know about Burning Man in the past. Um, I was told about this place. I don't know if anyone in the audience has been, uh, but it's a really wonderful place because it allows you to experiment uh, for a week. It's a sort of utopian city. And you, you build a city for a week and then you sort of dismantle it. So every year the city is sort of new and it allows you to explore concepts that are beyond, uh, you know, uh, how can I say, beyond the permanent, you know? And that's a really important, um, I already mentioned cradle to cradle. The idea that you arrive and there is nothing and you live and there is nothing is something that's quite powerful um, and impacted me a lot and impacted our students a lot because we were going with our students to build structures there. I've learned a lot. You'll see the journey. This is all a bit of an introduction uh, to everything we've done, you know, from shopping uh, experience, experiential centers for, for brands. You know, when I graduated, it was the, uh, the financial crisis. And so the scale we were dealing with was tiny, 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 but this was lucky. It was lucky. I tell students now, like you don't have access to the robots at Yak. Some of you that are on the MACAD program, that's a luck. Like if you actually think of things that you can afford, and if you make things that are maximizing expensive materials, this is really, really good because in the future it can only get uh, better, right? And we were approached by the weirdest <laughs> like projects. Uh, the, the, there was a, a, a person who worked at El Bulli, the, the restaurant in Catalonia, I think, who asked us to look at 3D printing food. Um, and so because we were doing G-code and uh, I was learning about G-code, Silkworm, et cetera, we, we worked on menus uh, that involved uh, 3D printing of food and stuff like that. So really a great thing about the new generation of architect is that they are trained in systems. And that means, and you're trained in coding and you're trained in machines and you are, I mean, as usual, architects are trained in so many things and that gives us access to worlds that are beyond ours. Uh, great, I, um, you, you guys still can see me and everything. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just kind of, okay, great, great. Okay, cool. So the idea that you're, you can be makers, you can be contractors. I mean, makers is just a cooler term for contractor, right? But, um, this building was really the uh, uh, epiphany of, of this uh, approach where we build a giant temple in the desert, 60 meters wide, 20 meters high. We had 18 days to build it with about 140 people. No one paid, all fundraised. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you about that as the sort of uh, maybe pre-conclusion of this, of this talk. But 
in all ways, you know, often we, we think of new buildings and I'll show you buildings that are kind of cool shape and stuff like that, but really we try and think in systems and we try and think with the local fabrication. So I'm just showing you this. That's not something I've shown many times. Uh, this is how the, the really the office could scale up because our office is now about 12 people and we could only scale up big, with big scale projects really. University of Westminster, where I teach since 10 years, uh, did an internal competition with the teachers, uh, ideas competition. And, and we won on the basis of using the Fab Lab, which is literally just down there to rebuild the project itself. So they bought this big building and they wanted us uh, to think about ideas and we rebuild the facade with these light scooping components because it's really dark, it's London. Um, and we were trying to attract the light through uh, panels that would be CNC'd inside the fab lab that's just here. Same with the interior, we suggested the students can get involved. And so everyone would be involved in the in the making of this thing. Crazy idea because you can imagine then what the contractor, the actual contractor said, you know? And so we kind of designed the contract to allow that little space for the students to be able to build that. Sorry, Artur, for yep. interrupting, but no I don't worries. Know if you think that you're sharing your screen. You don't. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. No. I, I hope I hope I hope I shared some of it. <laughs> no, you did, sir. Uh, until the until the, the the project of Westminster. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for telling me that. That's. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yep. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Arati. Cool. So that's the Westminster project that this is the Fab Lab that I was pointing out. And, uh, and this is the facade that lights, uh, scoops the light. And these were the interiors of the project that we had to comply with, with uh, building regulation, etc. I'll, I'll pass you on the, the, the actual uh, reality of a project that was really a, 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 an expensive, proper London-based project that uh, we worked on really hard. But I guess this uh, is the most important bit, that this wasn't about an idea, a good idea, a bad idea. This was about creating a system that can involve people made uh, in relation to a, a, a sort of variation of forms that can be controlled and understood in relation to the environment, in relation to the architecture, uh, and in relation to the tools we had at the time. You'll see this as a pattern coming back in every one of our projects. And really the idea that this new community of architects, and it's all of you, have access to so many tools. It's incredible, it's unprecedented that you can download a robotic tool, a, um, an environmental tool, a, a structural tool for free out there. And I, I, I you know, you can check, uh, um, I, I know Felipe from our class shared all the plugins in one link, it was beautiful. Um, and, and, and so I, we were, I was really excited to also discover more ways to do things. Also, I think one aspect where your guys are so lucky is the concept of decentralized manufacturing or decentralized, um, the idea that, and, and you guys are not new to that because you were one of the first fab lab in Europe, I think, but the idea that the means of production are literally next to you, that you can fabricate things around you, a robot, a you name it, prototyping around you. This has changed and I think changes everything. You saw it during COVID when people were printing masks. Um, the means of production has escaped because we were focusing on services and, uh, and, and, and you know, as, as you kind of know, your power is to who has the means of production and now they're completely decentralized. And, and I mean that, I don't mean it in a, um, in, in a sort of superficial way, like the, my, our, our whole practice is based on being able to access lasers, uh, 3D printers and so on. Yeah. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Cool. Yes, we can. We have okay, brilliant. Cool, cool. All right. So don't hesitate to stop me if there's any problem. No problem. It's kind of, I'm trying. I only I can only see you, Arati. I, I, someone else, uh, everyone else has their camera off. So that's good. Cool. So you'll be my uh, <laughs> sign. Good. Cool. So um, I'll pass you on, on our machines, on our blogs. Um, you probably came across some of the stuff we do. Another aspect that I want to emphasize during this talk is entrepreneurial and uh, sort of self-driven, self-reliance, which is another principle of Burning Man I'll, I'll explain later. But one thing we've done in the past, uh, and we've done it a couple of times, is to raise funds for our project. So rather than waiting for a client and thinking, okay, I need a job, or I need this, or I need that, our students and ourselves have actually put an idea on, on Kickstarter and have received the funds from it. 
And so that's quite powerful because that means not only can you decentralize the means of production, you can actually decentralize the way your project is funded. And so that's a really, I think, is a very powerful tool to express your ideas and to get um, your ideas realized out there. So I couldn't help but start with actually my diploma project. So 12 years ago, I graduated from the Architectural Association. Um, and at the time we were using this generative component, uh, I was so lucky to be in one of the maybe only studio that had access to um, environmental uh, driven parametric tools uh, in, 2000, uh, in 2008 when I had my, my graduation. So we were working on this component that reacts to the sunlight. Um, we could test it. Uh, at the time it was a little bit harder. You know, I had to bring it to Ecotech and so on. You guys had you're lucky because um, you're able to export it into one holistic system. So you don't have to switch tool in order to develop systems that work. That was my diploma. I was looking at Oscar Niemeyer. He was 100 years old at the time. He's my hero. I became an architect because I loved what he was saying about nature and shapes. And he had his pen and it was so beautiful. Uh, but he was doing a building in Paris that was about to be sold. And I don't know if I felt the financial crisis coming or so on, but there was a financial crisis, at least within this building. And he was a true believer. When talking about values, he was a true believer in, uh, in democracy, in people. In, he, he did this building for free, no fees. Um, he was a refugee from, from Brazil. And, and I guess that's why he spoke from the heart. And that's really important for me. At the time, we had this, this president uh, who was saying he would uh, get rid of May 68, the, the heritage of when people actually went to the street to claim their, uh, their independence, let's say, from, uh, I guess, what we would call today uh, uh, things like, uh, you know, the top-down rules that are sometimes unjustified. My parents met at the time. Uh, they're on the top right. Here you go. Um, and the only reason they could meet, and they came from very back, different background. My dad is Tunisian. My mom is uh, from Brittany. It's thanks to this revolution. It's thanks to opening up the, 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 the boundaries, at least the, the mental boundaries that, that are set upon us. And I think we're experiencing something really, relatively similar at the moment. And I think that's also kind of interesting for me to show you guys that. Now, it was an environmental unit. Oscar Niemeyer had environmental credentials for this building. And so I wanted to test them against actual science and data and found out a few things. I'll, I'll pass you on the details of that, but I was trying to apply a, um, a skin that would actually perform and diffuse the light in, in, uh, in, in summer and let it through in winter. Very basic uh, criteria, uh, but the idea was really to create something that interacts with the sun and the form would actually be the result of this interaction with the sun. You know, there is this uh, first of May celebration of works. And so it's also the, the moment in Paris where light gets too hot. And so there would be this ceremony in which, uh, you know, light would come through on the first of May um, and we would have this democratic ground. As you can see, I was quite driven as a youngster uh, before creating my company. I was ready to change the world anyways. This happened, a uh, financial crisis came by. It was quite a shock because as a graduate, I thought I would go to, I don't know, Zaha Hadid or Richard Rogers, had a big interview there. Uh, didn't happen because no one was hiring, pretty similar to what's going on now. Um, and so I got a little bit troubled because I knew things that I thought was quite uh, advanced, yet not even the basic studios were hiring. And I really had to rethink you know, why is no studios in need of all these evolutions or these new tools that are happening? Like, why is there not a single studio that has a, a, a place where they can make things? I've, I was taught how to make things. I was taught how to think of um, environmental relationships and stuff. I was taught things that weren't being practiced in practice. And, and, and I think that's where you see a school being quite advanced. And I saw this at the YAC, same with the AA. I think we were being taught not what's needed to, today, but what's needed tomorrow. And so really, I, I, I encourage you to keep an open mind. I had to do things that were weird, like you see me with my socks. Um, in this case, we were partnered with Karen Millen, the store, to do a giant 
uh, basically a giant shop window that actually uh, had this giant dress, which was made of this very British smoking pattern. Um, this is really how I started the office uh, after doing my 3D printer. I thought that's too big to print um, and found this really basic material. I had almost no money to do this, about 8,000 pounds for a 30 meters uh, long shop windows on Regent Street. And so developing this sort of um, poetic uh, uh, project in which each one of those gates would tell a different story and bring people on a journey. Now I show you this because I was relatively lucky being in Regent Street and this initiative from the Royal Institute of British Architect May, mean, meant two things. One is uh, Virgin Galactic, uh, you know, the, the, the guys who are trying to, to do space tourism saw it and asked us if we could do a hotel for their astronauts uh, before they go to space. And honestly, it doesn't happen every day. I had this on Friday, delivery on Monday. And I remembered uh, something I was doing when I was learning computer science called uh, uh, recursion. Uh, we used a little turtle at the time. We were moving the turtle around and the turtle was creating these amazing drawings. And that's really, I was, I don't know, I was like 14 or something, but I stayed in class to watch the turtle draw things. And what I didn't know, it this was kind of what we call generative design now. The idea that the computer generates geometry for us based on simple rules, and then you just have to watch the show and then vary the, the, the parameters and watch the show again. And then you really act as a sort of gardener that mm, puts little recipe, elements of recipe, and then enjoys the result of that and tries to control the result with feedback loop. You know, we talked about this in the MACAD thing. Like once you can grow things, what is the feedback, you know, structural, environmental, et cetera. So in this case, we had same as my diploma project, light coming through in winter and light being diffused in summer, right? Then you see something else here. The, the, the branches were landscaped. So they were uh, providing thermal mass for the building and the branches would create cold air that would be cold by the chimney in the center, creating a stack effect, right? So this uh, design actually, which you'll probably recognize in Galaxia was the beginning of this understanding of creating a system that actually works with the environment. I was lucky because the, the, the project of Karen Millen raised their income by about 30% because everyone was curious. They were just like, you know, what the hell, what is this thing? I wanna touch it, I wanna interact with it. And then it happens that the dresses were at the same color as the installation. And so they, they asked us to do the winter uh, display after that. And then after that, five projects that came through. And so these are just example of using a pattern that is generating a surface instead of a surface that has a pattern on top. And to me, that's really important. That was a milestone, at least in my understanding, because we were taught how to populate surfaces at the AA at the time. And I noticed that actually, if you can make a pattern that creates a surface, you can do things like this. You see, that's just me having fun with a laser at the time. And the one on the left is actually a flat sheet. So the one here out of the laser is actually this thing. So I understood that because I was a little bit broke to some extent that I, you know, I didn't really have the job, I started setting up the whole thing. I had to think of a way to make something 3D from a sheet that was very uh, affordable, off the shelf. And this idea of off the shelf is really important, you'll see. These type of drawings were crucial to explain to the client what the hell is parametric design, right? This is called a matrix. I'm sure you'll see it many, many times and you have it uh, you know, with your teachers. But when you start dealing with systems, you cannot think of one form. You have to document how the form varies. You're dealing with almost living things. You know, we all have the same DNA kinda. We just have different noses, different mouths, different skin colors, but we're all made from the same code, right? How do you document that, right? When it comes to the object and in relation to what? So in that sense, you interact with the local, uh, well, with the, actually the local site, but also with the client and with the fabrication devices. So these are some of the pro early projects that I worked on, somehow became an experiential marketer, uh, doing a lot of shop windows. Um, but something else I've noticed at the time, uh, not only can you involve the client, but you can also involve the people that make it. Um, and so this was Arab, Shanghai. Somehow we, you know, they were so excited to do this. Uh, they all came on site and we spent the whole night building this thing, right? This is James Strong. He's now kind of director in my office, but we still remember that night when we were building this together. Um, and that's kind of interesting is the moments that you get to build together, literally build, 
is the moments you bind people together. And I don't know if you read the Homo Sapiens by Harari, but he says actually civilization started as soon as we decided to build temples together. And that link, that social link, we've lost a bit because now we're kind of, uh, we have a concept and we go on site and we tell the contractor, you do this, you do that, that's not satisfactory enough, but you don't build the actual link that, that is that sort of human link that you can create with architecture. So I'll pass you on, on all of these fascinating de 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 detail. And, uh, and, uh, and this is the other lucky moment I had. Uh, Bureau Happel Engineering are literally next door to Karen Millen. And they kept on passing by this store. And, uh, and they saw it and they're like, oh, that would be nice. We're redoing our headquarters. Why don't we do the entire thing, same thing in wood? And I, I was like, well, uh, OK. <laughs> you see, that's the thing. You can take entrepreneurial risk as long as you can back them up after. Uh, but that's the joy. That's the joy that I find. That's the growth. That's the qualitative growth. You set yourself a challenge and you go for it. So I was lucky enough to find online Aaron Potterfield, who actually lives in Barcelona. I don't know if he's in the audience, but he put online on the Instructable a open source technique called Lattice Hinge. Uh, and I downloaded it, played on Grasshopper with it, and then created this with, with my team. Um, you know, we had a laser cutter. I just made a business plan for FabPub, so managed to raise funds to buy the, a laser. So we had the laser next to our pub. We were squatting a pub at the time, hence FabPub. And then we were doing this. We were doing all these variations, and we could actually present to Burrapold not a drawing, but this. And they would choose. What I find really interesting in that image um, is like, how do you then select stuff, right? If you can do any parameters, like how do you select things? And often, and, I, I, and still yesterday we did this in the office, you put them all, and to be honest, the most uh, natural, and what by I mean natural, the one that is most obvious often is democratically chosen. Like it's, it's I'm sure you'll agree on the one on the left feels right, right? It just feels right. I can't explain it, it feels right. Well, that is something I find fascinating, not being scared of democracy, right? It just, it just when you put this in front of a client, I kind of have a feeling I know what he's going to choose because everyone else has already chosen. And, um, and I find this quite powerful because that means that you can really engage the client, engage your team, engage people around, even the builders, even the, the people that you don't necessarily engage with. But you have to do this exercise. You have to kind of blindly do matrices of your versions. And that can be a bit daunting because you already know what you prefer. And you're like, well, you know, what's the point? Well, the point is to engage. The point is to get people in your team on your side, make the same choice as you rather than imposing choices on the top down. And this idea of top down versus bottom up is something I find crucial in what I've learned in the AA. Um, so this is, at the time I didn't know this meant we were contractors, but no one else could build this thing. So there were no choice than to actually start this empirical loop of building, failing, building, failing, which is what created this project, the, the wooden wave. This project uh, was a bit of a dance with things like AC units and projectors and all the things that happen in actual buildings. Uh, and so we had to modularize this thing. It then became a product. Now, that's an interesting architects. They tend to reinvent the wheel all the time. Like they tend to do a new building, a new project, a new design for everything. That is not economical. <laughs> you have to think in terms of project, but also in terms of product. And we have developed the wooden way. We still develop it. You know, it's something that we are working on on a constant basis, similarly to the software. Silkworm is something we keep on developing. Sil Silkworm 2 came out recently. Uh, we learn from people. We learn from the use. We keep up on iterating, and we release I mean, it's a product, it's free, but it's a product. It's something that we use on a constant basis and it's treated as a product. That means I can do things like, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, things that, that people that deal with products do, like project management, like distribution, like another world that architects are not used to, you see? So we sell products. We, you know, we have showrooms, we have distributors, we have gallery representing us. Um, and this is a very strange thing I've noticed that I wasn't taught. And I think that's because I dealt with a relatively small scale, but that is really nice because then we can send the products to the machines. That means we can actually send the machines directly. 
that's something I've learned with this project in Shanghai relatively early on, uh, which was if you can control the, the codes that you send to your machines, you can create an aesthetic that is based on the codes. Rather than imposing something to a machine you misunderstand, you actually develop and you send your machine, you don't send the actual object, and then you let that aesthetic emerge from the constraint. Like I remember going to Yak and seeing this beautiful earth printed with a pattern similar to that. And I was like, yes, that pattern cantilevers just right, right? Because otherwise it falls down. Now, the other thing I've noticed at Yak is you guys look into the materials. Now, materials are crucial. When I started printing, I didn't. I had no idea we were using PLA. Like PLA is the most common material for uh, printing, and I really noticed very much later that it's a compostable plastic that comes from renewable. I had no idea, but understanding cradle to cradle meant that I could see that if it comes from the ground and it can go back to the ground, then it's forever, right? Provided you do good agriculture, which is another topic that I'm looking into. But this is very important. Petroleum is not forever. Crops are forever if they're done well. So anyways, so that was a project we did with COS, uh, COS the fashion brand, and I'll take you to Burning Man after that. But this was really amazing because I guess slowly I built a bit of confidence to tell clients that sometimes they need to really tackle the issues that are happening. They are owned by H&M. H&M does fast fashion, as you know. I went there, I said, you guys, like, we have to talk about this because I don't want this to be like greenwashing. It has to be real and it has to involve new technology, new ways of doing things. And they completely embrace it. Like often we think that if we tell a client, you know, bad things, they'll, they'll reject us. But sometimes if it's done in a, pro in a productive way, not just like blaming, not just like you're wrong, this is terrible, I'm not going to work with you, but actually saying there is an issue. I can suggest that, that, that to solve it. They will love you. They will love you. Of course, there's, what's there not to love if you can find solutions to help? People want to be helped. Companies want to be helped. And that's something I've really noticed. And sometimes I see younger generation, you know, going in the street and, and like, you know, shaming, shaming. And I, I feel like it's, it sometimes can create adversity rather than kind of solution. So this project was a really nice. I really enjoyed it because it was tackling with uh, module sizes. Uh, we were printing in the fab labs next to the site. We were using compostable stuff, although we didn't end up composting because everyone wanted a piece of that project. So it ended up in everyone's places. All the employees, of course, have one. They grow tomatoes on it. Uh, we have our table is made of one of them. And then we did something really weird as well. We printed it flat. And you're like, well, surely then you laser cut it. But no, because laser cut creates waste. And if you print this in midair, it's really slow. And you have to use things like ABS. So you go back to petroleum. I was not interested in printing in midair for the, for the sake of printing in midair. Like it had to make sense in relation to what the hell we were building. And so it was interesting. We were looking at the, the shortest path between to accelerate the print because we had to print about 700 of these modules. This was the, I think the biggest uh, PLA print ever attempted. So uh, it was quite something. And um, really, in that case, we had to work with engineers that understood that complexity. We sent them relatively simple grids, and they came back with points of breakage, and we would update our model. You'll see in Galaxia, it's something relatively similar, uh, a little bit of a different scale. But this was really just a big kind of pre-Burning Man uh, chunk for you guys. Um, and it's, on, it's 30 minutes, so that's perfect, 15 minutes to take you to the desert. That's quite good. Cool. Um, this is, I mean, that's important. Um, I, I, you know, this is what we call life cycle assessment. Um, it's comparing scientifically the impact of one material over another. Often we're like, because when we did that that conifera project, uh, you know, on Dizine, there was this guy who's like, ah, oh, PLA is worse than uh, petroleum plastic. And I, I was not having it because I, I did a lot of research on this and really it's not such unidimensional that you're like it's better or worst really pla is much better for its toxicity when it's incinerated it's 60 times less toxic less car car basically less cancer when you burn it it's actually way better into a, of lots of uh, different kind of criteria and and I think we, we try to understand uh, uh, environmental design with this is, uh, you know, this is better, this is worse, when actually we should understand the different dimensions, the different criteria. So I really encourage, there's Tortuga, there's Bombix, there's many plugins to do this. 
Um, but this is our next project. But I'll I'll, I'll come back to that uh, maybe when uh, when I come back to Yak in a in a year or something. But um, I just want to take you to Burning Man so that you get a, a chance to see where I got my second half of my kind of uh, experience. So these are our students. We were keen to involve everyone. Uh, for me, that's really crucial. Like when you tell something, people forget. When you teach, they may remember. But when you involve them, they remember truly. You need to involve people into the building, and that was really important and something. You you guys do a lot at YAC, uh, which I think is really groundbreaking. These are the 10 principles of Burning Man, uh, radical inclusion, gifting, radical self-reliance. So you see that city is not just a festival as it's known, uh, but it's actually an experimental city to follow a framework that is set by the founder, Larry Harvey. But actually, we say it's set, but actually these criteria, these principles emerged from the community slowly you know, rule after rule after rule. And, in, and in what he says is instead of doing art about the state of society, we do art that creates society around it. So the idea is that that um, city is full of artists. There's no spectators. Yeah, it's an emergent culture. We see culture as self-organizing. That's kind of something that was new. I was like, oh, I thought, you know, we can self-organize like systems for design. I didn't know that culture could self-organize as well. And slowly I learned about the, the background of all this ideology of all these geodesic domes that I was seeing. And I don't know if you guys know Buckminster Fuller, I hope you do, if not buy this book, uh, Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. There was this thing called the Earth Rise in the seventies when people finally saw the earth from space and they all have a revelation and they all started thinking in terms of we are on a tiny spaceship in the middle of nowhere and and that was a real revolution my parents told me about it they they experienced it and so that was the moment we realized we had to think in systems truly including the earth so our students are also broke you know obviously they're students um and so they had to think of very simple of the shelf stuff they could self-organize and that they could deliver to the desert and assemble and so instead of thinking of ideas, of drawings, they would just go to the workshop, cut stuff, or use their knives and go with a piece of cardboard and sort of uh, evolving geometries, uh, letting them grow and learning with it, with us, right? So we were on site, that's Georgia, uh, who built this shipwreck, uh, that's Thanasis building fractal cult. We were building these hexa yurts, which are an open source system to build like, um, uh, camps uh, that are insulated and we were in the desert using things like off-the-shelf scaffold pole that we can rent because uh, it's not that common to be able to rent stuff uh, building building materials but scaffold poles are great um, you know that could be a new business plan you guys rent uh, building materials and that would be great uh, but in the meantime we use scaffold poles we laser cut this stuff uh, we build it together some giant fish were coming to visit us um, this was really the joy of building in a world where uh, a sense of freedom is here, a sense of creative freedom. Now, I really, it wasn't my thing at first, honestly, like it took me several times to really understand what this was about. But this is really the moment that made it for me. Like, this is the temple. The temple is a space where people put offerings and it's really deep. Like, it could be, you know, words about a deceased relative. And it really struck me that one, you could build such a big CNC cut thing and call it a temple and that it could have something beyond a pavilion, so to speak. Um, and two, the fact that everyone could feel spiritual without religion associated to it. So I'll come back to that, but this is really when this took a, a, another deep meaning on a spiritual level, on a metaphysical level. Um, so I'll pass you on all the, the student project. Uh, I've got about 10 minutes to finish this. So, but really this is uh, maybe the groundbreaking, the groundbreaking uh, learning curve for me. So I'll share it with you. On the left is the Infinity Tree by Tobias Power and on the right is Bismus Biwak by uh, uh, John Lung. Very cool, uh, reotomic surface, fully kangarooed, uh, crazy stuff on the left simple of the shelf timber on the right, right? I was, of course, as a geek, you want to make it work. But then I realized, one, uh, the laser cutting company didn't write the names of the pieces on the wood. Uh, two, everything was reciprocal. So every piece depended on each other. Three, it wasn't symmetrical. So none of the piece repeated. Four, it didn't stack. So we had to put it all and lose it again 
into a big truck that really the truck didn't care that we didn't have the naming convention. Even the truck driver told us some advice on how we could design this better. <laughs> you know, you gotta be humble, right? We're the teachers, so we failed twice. Uh, anyways, look at the other one, how neatly it's stacked, right? Only one truck bed. I was told like, you know, the truck is as much the designer as the architect. Now that's a really important notion to me because we are often like, oh, we're a design, we're gonna do the design and then, no, we're one component. The truck is a component of design. Um, the way that you use materials that are understood as of the shelf is a material, is a design choice. The contractor can, can tell you that he is a designer. Why are we designer? They're designing. Like, what about the engineer who tells you that this just doesn't work? <laughs> He's a designer, right? So anyways, we ended up not finishing this one. And this one, they were just kind of enjoying it so much. And the truth is, um, I had to kind of rethink this whole parametric thing, really. Um, and so this project came about after that. This was Tangential Dreams. And it was made of um, off-the-shell two by four that were cut using, say, a graph mapper following a sine curve. I'll, I'll pass you on the detail. The idea was to express curvature with straight line, off-the-shelf straight line, right? So all these are off-the-shelf stuff. And really, the spiritual nature that I talked about was that we stenciled people's dream on here. And people would write stuff on top of the stencils, you see? And so the idea was that not only was uh, it what is gorge with emotion, but actually the project would enrich itself over time. So the people climbing there every time would have something to say and every time would have something to read that was different. So there was a real dialogue between people and the structure, uh, which was really quite, quite amazing. Um, and I think Burning Man appreciated that because when they gave us the temple, I think they saw a potential for a temple, a potential seed for a temple. You see, I've, I've been relatively lucky in that the projects follow themselves quite neatly. But sometimes when you trust uh, what you're doing, you, you get the best surprises. This is the Burning Man temple. So that's the one that we submitted. Um, it's quiet. It's very far away. This is David Best, who started doing temple by using offshoots of a, of a dinosaur toy company. They were, he was using, you know, when you laser cut, you always have this sheet at the end. He was using that and like the aesthetic of that. Um, and really something that really struck a chord with me is, is, is the idea that you could express that you're not okay. Is the idea that the fragility of what you're feeling can be expressed and you can all cry together about it. Everyone goes through pain. Everyone goes through tough times. Everyone goes through happy times. And that's something that unites everyone. And so this idea that a building can help express that was really what struck a chord uh, in me. And often we think of spirituality as the domes and we remember our cathedrals and how they were kind of really sometimes oppressing and we forget the true nature of spirituality which is something that connects all of us the word religion actually comes from religiare who is actually linking linking people right that sounds a bit weird nowadays right anyway so the dome on the left is what we know and on the dome on the right is what we were attempting to do with this which is to actually bring people in start from the human scale and unite them into a center space believe it or not that was actually the brief of burning man uh, temple it was the first time they opened it up as a competition for other people the brief was to start with intimate space and end up with uh, a collective space so you can see i mean you probably recognize uh, this is uh, the bjarkingal's big uh, uh, sphere and uh, they got into it and then they came to ask us for bolts and we were building this collectively and everyone was helping each other during the construction. We were about 140 uh, relatively horizontal structure, to be honest. Uh, we had a kitchen lead, we had a, a build lead, we had a, all kinds of uh, um, funny, uh, 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 unusual things for an architect. Um, but really what I loved was this. When we opened it, people would fill it up with stuff and they would continue the build but a different kind of build, you see? But really it wasn't a project about a shape. It wasn't a project about a design as such as we know it. It was a project about a journey, a collective journey of understanding what's at stake and how can we do it together and unite onto this uh, topic. So you can see <laughs> this is uh, the build crew. They were already hugging. I mean, what's been achieved collectively was pretty uh, impressive. I, you know, I just find it hard to believe it sometimes, but. Really, it started with 
uh, just listening and working with other people. These are WASPs. They helped us do these giant teardrops in the middle of, of Galaxia. And really, that's that's how we kind of worked on it. Again, Aaron uh, Potterfield kind of led this in the US whilst I was trying to lead this from the UK. Um, and, uh, and this was quite something. It never slept. By nighttime, I would call him, share techniques, and he would share me his feedback at night. And it was a really round the clock learning curve. We only had six months from the moment of winning to the moment of building. So we had to think of every possibilities, right? Like how to assemble this thing, how to match it in the truck, how to build a camp where we're gonna stay, how to assemble it given a certain weight constraint. Those kind of stuff we don't think about as architect. We don't think of the maximum weight of a crane, right? And that's the beauty of when you start becoming the builder of your structures, you can actually understand with the crane operator how to lift something, how much should you lift? We were lucky Burning Man got a new crane that can lift more, but <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it often things that we don't think of. The other thing is, and you, you saw the learning curve from the, the project, the Infinity Tree, we had an engineer that gave us feedback on off the shelf product. I remember Aaron telling me, we need to use Simpson products, stop designing laser cut connections, right? And he's, he's right, like the more you can use off the shelf stuff, the more you go to B&Q, or I don't know what it is in Spain, but the, the, the more you can go and learn about what you can actually buy off the shelf, the more you use things that you don't need to reinvent, the more you can reuse, right? You know the reuse, repurpose, recycle, um, these are really important aspects of the circular economy. So this was designed from the, the, the one dimensional component, the timber, to the 2D, to the 3D, to the 4D, one dimension at a time, one IKEA drawing at a time, one test at a time. Um, of course, we had to prototype this thing. Just to give you a sense of the scale, this was our village. Uh, these were the sort of giant uh, matrices of fabrication that we had. Um, and so we had to think of this as a, as a system of construction. Now, one, if I can say anything, I think humility is key. Like, being one component of a system is part of system thinking, right? Dishwashing, cooking, listening, respecting the kitchen crew, respecting every single member of the team as an equal, as someone who has, who is a node in that system is so important. You know, we tend to think architects are on top and we're designers and we, it's really, uh, a little bit of our downfall, to be honest. If you see only 5% or 4% of all construction worldwide have architects. So I just want to point this out, right? Another stat, right? So we completely lost control over the built environment, which itself is 40% of all uh, carbon footprint. So gain back control over making, because one, that's also where the money is, to be honest, not with Galaxia, trust me, we lost money with that, but with contracting. Right? So how do you build stuff that makes sense that people can assemble themselves or, I mean, even better, right? Self-built, if the, 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 you can go there with your team, build it with the people, show them the constraint and people understand why things cost the thing that, the way they cost, right? So we don't make up numbers, we have spreadsheets and so on and so forth. So the complexity of being the builder of your project means you have to think of scaffolding, you have to think of foundations. Now. You know, I, 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 uh, I've been to Barcelona, lucky enough to see Gaudi's work. This is something Gaudi did in the, in the Casa Mila, in the courtyard. There is a bike wheel, right? The bike wheel holds all the pressure of the courtyard, right? I think, something like that. Anyways, this is the, the, the scaffold lead. He's like, oh, you cannot dig into the dust. You cannot legally dig the playa more than a meter deep. So he's like, well, let's do a bike wheel. Let's do a giant bike wheel that can take all the weight. And, and that was, I think, a really beautiful symbol of the team. We actually were all in one of those uh, moments when we dropped the scaffolding. We knew that every single member of that structure was doing his job, right? And literally, metaphorically, it was a bit of a, of a sort of, a, um, everyone was like, well, where's the central column? You know, that's the main thing we've always heard. Where's the central column? But the truth in a true decentralized system, there's no central column. I mean, we did put a few columns here to reassure the engineer there, but uh, they weren't even needed. And it's just one of the guys in the team was like, we need columns. We need, 
<laughs> so we just put them there to just, you know, the engineer is not going to say no, right? Um, anyway, so what was really beautiful is how people took ownership of this, how they, not just during the build, but during the actual opening, and they put the most like beautiful messages, and it was sad, it was also happy. I got married in that project, uh, you know, telling you about uh, being involved in what you do. And uh, that was a true involvement. You see my wife here and my mom holding a microphone. Um, it was a beautiful moment because it really showed the belief of that space and the power of that space on a personal level, not just as an architect, but a true uh, personal belief that this can work. And to be honest, I couldn't have dreamt of a better wedding. The most beautiful thing, as well as, I guess, personally, the wedding, but that I witnessed in this is when we were building, we had a, a Native American tribe that came. And uh, we were on their land, the Paiote land. And I was feeling bad. Honestly, I almost didn't want to see them because I felt really bad. You know, we obviously like building a festival on their land. I mean, that's how they I thought they perceived it. And they, and I said, I'm sorry, <laughs> like first thing I said, I'm sorry. And then he's like, Arthur, every sacred building is sacred to us, just that. And they blessed every single people that built this project one at a time. We couldn't help it, we all cried. It was so beautiful to see the universality of spirituality and sacrality. And uh, I, I just, it's hard to explain the feeling of knowing this and the collective sorrows that are created when 70,000 people are around in silence, a project that we burn, right? It's hard to explain that without you being here. And I hope we're not going to burn too many projects in the future, but there is this notion of fragility. There's this idea that things are completely impermanent, including ourselves. And that is powerful. It's a powerful thing. And it was already um, powerful to have this journey, but to actually end it clean behind ourselves, leave no trace truly was something that is, um, you know, holistic. <laughs> I don't have another word for it. So we cleaned it all. All the steel was recycled. All the ashes were mixed with granite, decomposed granite, not to vitrify the, play the playa. And everything was taken by the steel company. The granite was recycled for the year after. And we left the playa with nothing. There was nothing. And I came back to London, had the chance to work with someone called Chris Precht uh, in Austria, who I guess got moved by this approach and asked to work, strangely enough, in Saudi Arabia, another des desert. And we used the sand to build the sand. Uh, and we did conifera after that. And so we were trying to apply this idea together after that. And that's the last project I'm going to show. And I, I know I'm running five minutes late. This is a catharsis. This is what we wanted to build this summer before COVID. Strangely enough, it looks like the COVID virus. But <laughs> it's actually the Poincaré disc. It's a fractal. And the idea was not to burn this one, but to disassemble it and create a new ritual in which we would disassemble it and reassemble it in London. And the idea being that, similar to that skyscraper that I showed you, that a project can have multiple lives, that a project can be um, gorged with, with the feelings and the dialogue that it can create as an amphitheater in one place, and then go somewhere else and create this dialogue somewhere else. Because Burning Man has one of its principal radical inclusion. How can you be radically inclusive if you have to go there? And so we wanted to bring that project to people. And so I'll, I'll finish on that but uh, this is something that I hope we can still build. And I hope that you guys can join us. Uh, and as you know, uh, uh, you have my website, I think, mamu-mani.com. And don't hesitate to reach out, info at. And uh, I really hope that you can be part of that journey. So thank you, everyone. And I uh, hope that was clear. And 52 minutes, boom. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you for, for a great presentation. Um, if you can stop sharing the screen so that we can see each other, yeah. that's great. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for the talk. Thanks for for uh, for an effort of um, explaining the principles of your work, the beliefs that you have as a person, and how this is uh, translated into your design, into in your decisions 
on, on, on the projects that you are working on. I think this is really unique and, and it's very necessary today rather than following, you know, like traditional um, massive uh, uh, ideas of what architecture is or, or, or how we do architecture, rethinking it from scratch, something that is um, uh, necessary, but it's also aligned with one's personality. So I think that is fundamental. I also believe it's great that you're showing how architecture and how the tools of digital manufacturing could actually scale up. You know, it was mm. only a few years ago that yeah. Uh, this accessibility to the digital manufacturing have allowed us to have machines in our schools or in our offices, right? But then uh, you are doing a great job on, on showcasing how we can actually, uh, you know, like surpass the scale of a small product or of a small prototype um, and, and, and really get into a scale that could have a real impact into um, uh, the environment and, and the necessity, let's say that the environment has today in terms of climate change, sustainability um, um, and circular thinking. And, and you have done that in a very holistic uh, way, no? From, you took us from the systemic <laughs> thinking uh, and systemic uh, education of an architect to parametrics, to ideas of reuse, repair, recycle, to decentral decentralization to even crowdfunding, and we will speak about that as well. And, 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 and last but not least, to, to collectivity, you know, and to the, um, to the sense of this uh, um, uh, sacred space that we serve as a society. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like to maybe warm up the discussion. Please feel free to share your question in the chat or ask to be given um, uh, the microphone to, 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 to have a direct question to Artur. Um, but I would like to start uh, and warm up a bit um, um, our company uh, with your last project, you know, mm -hmm. with the principle of your last project, with mm. the principle of this idea of design for this assembly. Because um, I think that for long now, we have been using terms of sustainability, you no, know, like, or, or even self-sufficiency, we also use it. Um, and, and in a way, um, it, it becomes so vague and so, so open. I mean, it's, it's, it's everything and nothing at the same time, unless you start specifying it, no? Yeah. And I think that um, uh, even the certificates of leads or the similar, they are based on very cold and passive calculation of mm -hmm. what kind of material you have, what is your orientation, how many solar panels, Etc. And and we start to lose the 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 principle of what sustainable is, of how design can actually contribute into this uh, idea of sustainability. And now it seems that we start understanding that sustainable is not only something that produces the resources that they need in terms of of energy, but sustainable is also something that in its design it um, um, it 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 integrates you know what happens after the lifespan yeah. of the building yeah. after this building is gone it also questions the idea of of uh, permanency it opens up more uh, possibilities of of the temporal character of, of architecture and also the the caution and the carefulness that we need to put into this design process so that we can reuse than um, some of these parts. Yeah. So I, I want to I want to ask you about your 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 notion on on the necessity of design for this assembly today, whereas we haven't been learning uh, from the past uh, in relation to that, and and why sustainability is approached in in, in such a way um, that is very far away from the very essence of of uh, this idea of reusing let's say, adding value to things that otherwise would have been considered waste. Yeah, I, I think we, we, we never fully uh, get connected with the afterlife of stuff or the place where it comes from. Like, I, I think, and I don't talk just architects, like we throw things away and we kind of trust that the recycling bin goes to recycle, right? I, 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 you know, there's been a few scandals like recycling doesn't end up in recycling. We don't even know what the process of recycling versus composting versus biodegrading, but versus 
and that's I'm talking about humans, like in general. We don't know where our crops come from. We don't know why we have bananas in winter. We don't know where the banana come from. You know, we don't know what the the, the person growing the banana is doing. We we eat steaks, you know, already packaged for us without killing the animal. We are completely disconnected with where things come from, where they go, and that's just the nature of urban life. And we've we you know we had a massive urbanization after the you know during the industrial revolution that still continues today. This disconnection happens more and more, and the more we can you know this idea of decentralization where we have access to our means of production, we don't separate factories because that's what happened. Factories went away, everything went away. Cities became this service-based place where we are a bit disconnected from everything that is physical. And we just kind of end up with in a world of ideas. Ideas are clean; they don't bother us, you know. And we let the dirty stuff outside, right? That's pretty much kind of what happened a little bit. Now, but it's hard to learn without the dirty stuff. It's hard to innovate without getting your hands dirty. Without um, and so Burning Man is a weird place because, you know, it, it's it's one of the few places where you build the city. Like, we don't build a city. Like we 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 de-risk everything. We have contractors that take care of the risk. They have their insurance. We just like minimize ourselves to the point that we become almost useless, to be honest. And I, I find I find it like when you actually look at the stats, when you know that only four percent of all architecture uh, is made by architects, we are a disappearing species <laughs> as a profession. And the reason being is people don't understand what the hell we do. And I think I see this, and again, it's not, I know we know, I know we are architects, right? But but ask my mom, like, or ask like the people that are not involved in our world, they don't know who this famous architect is. Actually, they get excited when they see something on Netflix, right? But they don't, they, they don't know our world. And we've stayed so closed in the people that, um, in a sort of theoretical, ideological loop, that we got so disconnected with the people that people stopped understanding what architect did. And then you had the modernist movement where everything was fixed into some concrete, soulless, depressing building that never will go away, that is completely dis disconnected from the soul of people. My dad grew up in Sarcelle, which is one of the suburbs of Paris. And there was this thing, Sarcellite, where people were throwing themselves from the window. and and that's the kind of place that modernist architect were saying we need. And every, you know, every week I would go back there and think, what the hell are we thinking, right? I wasn't even an architect, but I hated architect before becoming an architect because I thought that's what architects thought. But you know, we really have to be uh, moving on from concrete. And I don't say this just because of cement and you know the damages of cement. We have to move on from the idea of a, of a building that is just forever. And, and that takes a little bit of letting go of our ego. That takes the idea that what you're gonna build will disappear in 20 years, might be somewhere else, someone redo something from it, you know, and it still can be beautiful and you still can shine as artist and express your soul. I mean, you see the Saint Pompidou in Paris. So one does not go against the other, but I think we're quite fearful of that. And I think it's a, a result of our disconnection. And, and so the more we can be, take part, like please take part of a building site. You know, I, I, I recognize a face here in the audience, Michael, who was building Tangential Dream. Here he is, and I see him. Uh, you know, it was so amazing to learn from each other. I mean, I learned a lot from just seeing him perform with the wood and he had experience with carpentry. Learn from carpenters, learn from metal workers, spend time in a metal shop, spend time in a, sorry, I keep on blabbing, but I uh, don't know if that addresses that. Gain control <laughs> on making, no? That's what you said. Gain, gain control on building, on building the stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I see that um, Alex, uh, Alex has a question for Artur. And if anybody else, please uh, leave, leave your name in the chat. Um, yes. Alexander. Uh, thank you very much, Arthur, for the wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, I think uh, it was very inspiring. Uh, I wanted to mention the fact that we are personally touched, uh, trying to be a track deliverer now uh, to design a new architecture. Uh, Here you go. We are literally going out of the factory, uh, getting ready into the making and, and doing. 
uh, with robots um, and, and we, we so much align uh, with your vision. Uh, we enjoy so much and, and, and we're glad that we're getting more and more involved <laughs> with SIAC uh, that we can go uh, together uh, even further. Um, maybe one, one, one more question in, in the topic. Um, you spoke a lot about ego, how do you actually as an architect and designer succeed to reduce your ego and be able to let things emerge, uh, emerge from the materials, emerge from the process, emerge from the people around us or the problematic that is around architectures and how we can like coordinate them, like orchestra, yeah. and make an orchestra <clears throat> of yeah. all these energies. Yeah. Um, maybe one thing in, in particular uh, yeah. that I, I want to, to, to question you, um, in your experience, uh, how much, uh, I see that you have a lot of human experience uh, of dealing with people in, in real life, no? and I yeah. think it's a key element. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering how much the digital tools have helped here, no? because we understand putting this technology and knowledge in it yeah. have helped. But do you feel that we already succeed to make the tool that we're using actually a communication tool? Um, because I, I feel this struggle that I wish to be able to exchange more easily. Uh, the open source community is wonderful, but it's a very geek environment uh, that we can share between us, architects that understand about this specific technology and interested by this. Um, but uh. <laughs> Did he get frozen just but, as he talked about communication and technology? <laughs> I, think, I think you get the question. No? I get the question. I hope you can hear my answer. Um, it's such a good question because really all we do all day and even today was deal with humans. And, uh, and it's normal, right? Like, look at us all together talking. And you can't avoid interpersonal things. You can't avoid the issues of miscommunication. And really, most problems happen from miscommunication. Someone not expressing a frustration. Frustration comes too late. It's too late. The building collapse. I mean, I'm summarizing. But <laughs> so how do you maximize communication, right? You guys use Slack. I know you do. The, 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 the other platform we're less familiar with are things that other, other fields, like the tech world, my, my wife is in the tech world, they use task management system. I know it's kind of weird because we are not, we're a bit of a closed uh, place, but as soon as you start, I and I, you started perfect, Asana, Trello, all these tasks can be decentralized. You do a backlog and you do what's called an agile, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, my wife lectured me on that, but she's like, how architects, why are they not agile versus waterfall? I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? And, and what she means is, in her team, she's project manager, they've got hundreds of tasks, right? They call it the backlog. And then they've got the to-do, the in progress and the done. And then they have priorities on each one of these tasks. And instead of being a Gantt chart where you have to finish one versus the other, every day they re-question the priorities and so that means it's much more dynamic and everyone knows and has a task assigned. So in a way, as a, like you say, you're really the director of an orchestra um, that deals with tasks. <laughs> And that's to me was a revolution. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I always thought like, damn, if I'm not here, like, you know, the people know what to do and what is the priorities and how do we even deal with that? And then that, uh, you know, agile mentality is something that comes from the tech world that architects are not so familiar with because we know Gantt charts and stuff. So that's one way that technologies have helped me at least deal a lot with the complexity of miscommunication, communication, et cetera, et cetera. And you deal with feelings, right? So when we were building Galaxia, for example, someone, one of the builders told me something beautiful. He said, uh, I know you do the spiel about technology, like, you know, what to build today. I know you do the spiel about, uh, you know, what we need to achieve and all these things, and this, or you need to do it. But he says, you need to do a heart check-in. You need to check if people are okay. Like, and, and I don't mean like, are they okay building this? Are they just okay? Like, you know, do they feel right? Is this, is there anything they want to say? And like, just to create that um, ground for uh, écoute, we say in French, right? Like listening rather than always, you know, imposing things, it lets emotions come to you. And I know it's hard because, you know, it's hard to take people's frustration, but they're not to me, they're towards the project, they're towards to separate, you know, this feeling of feeling attacked versus the project is attacked. And it's okay to attack a project. Like on the contrary, like attack the project, like tell me what's wrong. 
the idea that we take things personally, that's where ego comes in. That, that's what I feel. Like I feel like we have a tendency to personalize stuff that are actually targeted at a common endeavor. And I, I think that's, a, that's how I differentiate. That's how I don't get too many panic attacks. <laughs> Okay, I, I will try to moderate your answers, Artur, because we have more questions and only yeah. 10 minutes to go. Yeah. So, um, uh, Rigoberto, um, you, you, you want to unmute? Good luck. <laughs> yes, yes. I have a question regarding yeah. um, client base and profession. Yeah. It looks like marketing seems to be a really big topic for you as far as getting clients. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting to see. Um, the extent that you've had to go to to actually get a client, um, <laughs> it means that not only not not just architecturally, but um, really diagramming, communicating. Um, are you facing constant challenges that make you shift traditional ways of marketing, or are you or do you have a set formula that you you always depend on? Obviously, you know these different logistic systems of uh, the tech the technology realm. But architecturally, do you have something that you fall back on as an architect? Wow, that's a really good question. The, the idea that what we do includes a lot of marketing, I completely agree with that. But one could also see it as always trying to tell a story with a project. And marketing, telling a story, you know, it's the same, it's the double edge, right? It's like the same. Uh, but that's what matters is not the act of telling the story. It's not the, the, the method. It's what story are we telling, right? And the idea that we try and use technology or architectural things, I mean, at the end of the day, a 3D printer is, or I see it as an architectural tool, same with robots, same with parametric design. The goal is to reduce carbon, is to help the planet, is to create better human relationships, or that is eventually the, I guess you, you, if you call it a recipe, but that is the the driving force, the, the thing that unites all of us as a team here is we know that whatever project we're going to do has this driving force. Um, and, and so every client that approach us, they know there is something to follow, right? Like we talk about leadership, but you're only leading if people are willing to follow you, right? And, um, and so it, that will be the idea, maybe less focus on the method, the technology, more focus on the end goal. And we're we are given this opportunity to do that, right? The world is, is really confused how to help the planet meet its challenges. Like really we're confused. I mean, otherwise we wouldn't be on Zoom. I'd be in Barcelona now, you know, looking forward to the beer with you guys after this lecture, but we can't, I can't be with you because we're confused because we don't know how to deal with this crisis. So if you can provide some sort of solution based on personal experience, based on, constant research, constant curiosity, constant re-questioning of what you're doing, and you have some kind of, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel that maybe, you know, the life cycle assessment of this material is better than this one, then go and like, and people will just kind of follow you. They'll just kind of, and, and when I say people, I mean clients, builders, students, uh, colleagues, employees, uh, because there's not just client. I mean, clients are one aspect of making a, an office work, right? I know, I know they're important. I know, but you know, they hire you based on believing in you, and and so you are also <laughs> important and your team and what you're doing. Um, and then the clients come, right? They also come. They they find they find us based on that coherence. But if we weren't coherent the client, what are they buying at the end of the day? There's so many architects out there. There's so many solutions out there. Why do they come to us, right? And they just come to us through emails, literally info at. They just send us info at emails. I'm not kidding. Yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> so I have to pitch though, yeah. <laughs> Um, no, but it, it's important. No coherence, coherence on the work and belief on on the work um, that you're doing is is uh, is crucial for you know communicating and disseminating um, the impact of your projects, the past and the future ones. Uh, Sasan, you want to yes, ask no. a question? Uh, 
for the sake of time, I'm, and I'm going a bit fast. Uh, Arthur, uh, your works are amazing. Actually, I really interested in specifically the office works uh, that were that was you know kind of interactive and changing the spatial movement. And you have an awesome personality. As I really enjoyed the work. Um, there are some things that I wanted to ask you. One one of them is that. Uh, you you made you create and fabricate all these uh, projects and you bear parents them that was uh, pretty interesting to me but uh, conceptually uh, was it because of the sustainability or not and the next <laughs> question next question is that you mentioned uh, you you use a top down approach in aa and uh, bottom up <laughs> bottom up bottom up you, you mentioned yeah, yeah. Uh, good question. The, the the burning of project is not sustainable. Do not burn projects, or try not to. I mean, the the uh, the burning is part of a ritual that Burning Man does. It's called Burning Man because they burn a men a central effigy at the end of the event, and it's everyone around it. On Saturday, they burn this man based on pagan tradition, and then on Sunday, they burn the temple quietly. And it's the closure of this event, which is, I guess one could say, more of a spiritual uh, notion than sustainable. Of course, it's not sustainable to burn oh, it's stuff. It's more of the beliefs than... It's more the belief. You're right. It's more the, the, the credo than the uh, cogito, let's say. Uh, but, but, it's, 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 but what it does is, is unite people around the ritual. And um, what we want to do, and because Burning Man can be changed, because it's a city that that changes over the, the, the years, every year something. We wanted to challenge this and do a disassembly ritual because at the end of the day, the burning is a disassembly. It's a way to go back to ashes, right? So there is a notion of letting go and maybe there are ways we can do it. And I invite all of you to think about it. Can disassembly be ritualized because it's so beautiful? Uh, can it be choreographed? Can you disassemble in a in a way that engages with people so that they celebrate this process? Because if we don't celebrate it, we kind of ignore it. And Burning Man creates this celebratory and 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 ritualistic uh, component to architecture that I had no clue about. Like, I mean, why why would I know that you can all come a, around a project and 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 burn it together in silence or how can like this idea that this the, the idea of spirituality rituals and so on or ways that you can bind humans again uh, around the common projects these are it's very hard to teach them right you, you you would have to be part of it you would have to kind of understand it but it's beautiful and it's beautiful and and yeah i think we, we knew we were going to burn this thing so we we designed it with as little amount of material as possible we try and use wood that wasn't kind of shipped from you know another country try to use local wood try to use a uh, minimum amount of connection we used as little steel as we could we kept a spreadsheet of the weight of everything try to maximize tension minimize compression um, at the end the density of galaxia was the same as foam uh, same with conifera uh, the two projects were as light and structurally efficient as foam. And, you know, Buckminster Fuller asked uh, Norman Foster how heavy this bu his building is, right? I think this idea of lightness was not just sustainable in terms of, uh, you know, in carbon, but it was cheap. And so, <laughs> and it was cheap environmentally and financially because we had to fundraise it. So this was our money. I, I had to fundraise for Galaxia with my team. We, we sold t-shirts, we sold badges, we reached out to, we did fundraising dinners. We had to sell our ideas. We had to, um, every penny counted. And, and, and that's also very important. And we are disconnected with this because we use our clients' money, right? And so that's another aspect of that I can encourage you to do to fundraise for your own projects. Sorry, just went on and on. And sorry, bottom up. Bottom up just means that things come from, they are emergent, they're showing emergent behavior. Um, I mean, one could call it like aggregation or I heard the word discrete, you know, all these are modular architecture. Modular in a sense that they come from the elements 
outwards, right? They, you're not drawing a form and then finding the material that will fit that form. You're starting from a module that makes sense with your machine. You're making something that works economically, works structurally, and then you try and, 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 and kind of um, cluster it in a way that makes sense, that can be easily assembled, is assembled. You can integrate the systems between them. Metabolist architecture was the best example of that. And, and it didn't take, uh, you know, there's not that many metabolist buildings, but it was a beautiful era where they thought of growing buildings. Maybe, they, I don't know if they thought of ungrowing them, but this was the era where bottom of architecture was tried in Japan. Thank you. Thank cool. you so much. Thank you, guys. Um, a last question uh, from Ara. He also searched it in the group, but please, Ara, if you can unmute and ask directly. Hi, Arthur. Hello. Thank you. Hi, Ara. Uh, I, I, uh, I know we're, we're above time, so I want to keep it short. My question was regarding, uh, uh, do you think this movement of modular systems and the Burning Man culture of building for end of life will push the envelope further with digital fabrication and computation in this idea of like how people can shift from inner cities and paradigm out into the outside of outside of urban cities into rural places to create their own ecological architectural self-sustainable habitat you wow. think there's a place for that yes a beautiful question if we start with like uh, cities and we managed to decentralize enough that you can create rural communities that are fully independent. That's amazing because that's true harmony with nature, right? You have a decentralized um, uh, community in the midst of a forest. Uh, I mean, I, I you know, I'm, I like where you're going with this. Um, that would be incredible if we can live in true harmony. You know, obviously. That is what we want, or at least what I would want to go back to uh, eventually. But being a little kind of more immediate, given that we already have our cities, um, I think the immediate uh, element is to use this modular thinking and this on, on either new builds or as refurbishment project of existing buildings. It's a little bit easier uh, for now. Although the objective would be to indeed fully decentralize things to the level that you don't need to have, um, you know, you don't need to, to necessarily spread and you don't need to actually go city against nature. I say this, but I don't know if you know Arcosenti, uh, the idea of hyper buildings. Um, Arcosenti was a, a beautiful, um, I mean, it is it's still in, in uh, I think, Arizona or not far from Burning Man. Uh, the idea that there would be buildings that are holding of everything they can do they hyper buildings because they have uh you know they have it all they have the farm they have the the, the factories they have the the, the, the habitation the, the and these are so kind of little spaceships that you know i mean some call them earth ship you know in, in in arizona they have earth ships where you actually have a building that can handle everything on its own fully radically self-reliant right if that's the case, if we understand our buildings as little spaceships, if we understand what we're building, then whether it's in a city or in the middle of the desert or in the middle of a forest, then it, you know, in a way, it's it's up to whatever you guys prefer to live. You know, I yeah, yeah I still like London, so I think I'll probably still be here. But you know, it it but but that idea of independence, of self-reliance, autonomous building that Arcosenti was exploring is, I think, it's really interesting. Whether it pushes digital fabrication or parametric design? I think so, because parametric design, ultimately, I, I, you know, I already talked about parametricism, uh, which is some, you know, obviously Patrick Schumacher talks about this. The idea to me, of course we are parametricists to me, of course it's a new way of doing things, I think. But where I see it takes us is not necessarily towards a liberal economy or what he's saying. I think it takes us closer to nature and natural systems. That's why I added the word echo there <laughs> because what it does, it forces us to think in system. It forces us to have one interface with natural things like the behavior of wood, the environmental simulation, the structural simulation, the you name it, all the parameters, input, output, and develop uh, hundreds of variations using things like Octopus, Wallacey, you name all these plugins that do genetic algorithms and stuff like that. So really you're evolving system in the computer 
And so you're reproducing natural evolution and therefore you're as close to nature as it gets, right? If I may say so. I mean, some are scared because they're still a little bit creationist, <laughs> maybe, you know? But if you're truly close to nature, then parametric design is truly close to that. And so ultimately, parametric design, including digital fabrication, it's a whole loop, makes you so holistic that you get much closer to natural systems, hence it being more um, of a driver towards environmental design. I think that's a, that's a beautiful <laughs> way to close, uh, not only because natural systems can, can inspire a, a new, let's say, performance in, in architectural space, but also because the whole idea of circular architecture uh, if we think of nature, nature doesn't recognize the idea of waste, no? Uh, nature always uses byproducts as a new resource for another system, no? So if we could manage to do that in architecture, um, following some of the principles that you have shared with us um, in, in relation to, to, to this circular design and thinking, I think that would be really revolutionary in, in terms of minimizing the impact of um, our built environment into uh, the natural environment. So um, thank you very much, Arthur, for your talk. Thank you for an inspiring uh, lecture. Thank you for setting up an example of entrepreneurship in architecture. I think this is also important uh, to follow one's passion and uh, create uh, a series of works around it. Um, it has been a pleasure and thank you everybody for participating actively and, and for your commitment. Uh, have a good night, have a good evening. Arthur, we see each other uh, very soon in the virtual classroom. So, yeah. See you very you soon. Thank you so much for that and thank you for listening, everyone. And, Great. Thank you. And, uh, thank see you soon. Thank you so in much. Person. Thank ciao, you ciao. so thank much. You so much. Bye. Bye, bye, guys. Bye. Thank, you, thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye.